Welcome back to another episode of Rock Boys Football, taking a deep dive into this UCLA football program heading into 2023. And what my brother, I mean, my brother is absolutely in love with this team heading into the season. There are some question marks, right? On paper, like if you don't follow recruiting, you lose DTR, who was a very quality quarterback towards the end of his career for UCLA. You lose Zach Charbonnet, you lose some guys on defense. On the surface, this UCLA team might take a step back from what they did in 2022. But when you dig into what they did in the transfer portal, bringing in five-star quarterback Dante Moore, this is a team that, Dill, I think you noted it. We talk about the Pac-12 like USC, Oregon, Utah, and Washington. And we kind of leave UCLA out. You kind of think they should be in that conversation. We're going to get into it. Now, before we do again, just want to say thank you to you guys. The support doing all these deep dives has been absolutely awesome. So one, if you do enjoy the content, you want to support the boys, consider subscribing to the channel, but more importantly, again, I say this all the time. The best part about doing this is hearing from you guys, what you guys think, who you think should start at quarterbacks and breakout players. So let us know in the comment section. Let's chop it up. Dill going to kick it over to you. This UCLA team, your darling team heading into 2023. How are we feeling? I mean, obviously, you pretty much summarized my feelings. I feel like we all think this top four in the the Pac-12, but like UCLA, you look last year, I mean, they manhandled Utah in a way we yes. were very rarely seen like someone physically just looked like they're beating up Utah, like they were able to do that. I think the one thing they got to fix is, is, is just kind of getting driven on on defense, and I think they have a lot of talent, and they just they didn't play an aggressive style. They're bringing in Danton Lynn from – Baltimore which I love I mean you look at what Baltimore Ravens coaches have done in terms of turning around defenses whether that's especially at the college level Mike McDonald coming to Michigan turning us around Mike McDonald Jesse Minter Baltimore Raven pipeline has changed the Michigan football program so man if they can catch a little magic with him and and again I think they have the talent it's just having the mentality that they're not going to give up a ton of yards I think they've been playing that bend but don't break style like, why not play a little aggressive? You have the guys to do it, and that's what I'm looking for. That's, you know what, that's like the biggest thing for me. If you look at this UCLA defense, especially up front in terms of a pass rush, this could be one of the better pass rushing defenses that we see in the country. Now, before we get in, we'll start on the offense side of the ball. I kind of just want to talk about why I am so high on UCLA as well. In the Pac-12, their schedule is absolutely elite. You take a look. You're missing out on playing Oregon and Washington. And you know, getting to the Pac-12 championship game, has a lot to do with who you're drawing in the Pac-12. You draw probably the worst five teams, right, in Stanford, Colorado, Arizona, Arizona State. But more importantly, where you get Utah and USC, I know both on the road, I absolutely love it, right? You play Utah as your first Pac-12 game. There are a lot of question marks about Cam Rising being healthy to start the year. So you want to play Utah early, and then you want to play USC late because what are the question marks we have about this UC-USC team? Super, super talented. Question marks about the depth. And you saw USC kind of taper off towards the end of the year last year because of the lack of depth. Will we see that again? Maybe a little bit of a question mark. So playing Utah there, USC at the end of the year, I like that. Now, Dale, I want to get into this team because, again, this is a very quality team. I'm going to ask you about the quarterback first. I think that's what most people want to hear about. What's your take on this quarterback situation heading into the 2023 season? I mean, I'd be lying if I had any real insight. Got I me. think I think everybody would be lying about it because they, they've really not let too much come out. Oh, you'd but... be lying if who who do you want to start? I mean, this is a this is a lot oh, for me. I want Dante more because I'm like a guy yeah. like, why not play the guy who's got the real upside to again go be a Pac 12 title? If Dante Moore works out, he's the best quarterback on this roster hundred percent. Yes. And, and why not just let it rip? I mean, again, you don't have anyone who's totally nails in terms of what you've proven. I mean, Collins, Collins Steele's coming over and, and he's played good football. Or, or full is start, like, he's a Jack. Like, I think they bring him in to just provide some depth. Now, I think you're being a little disrespectful to my guy, Ethan Gar- Garbers, who I think is a very quality quarterback, was a highly touted guy to high school. And I think the perfect situation is, I mean, I want, I trust Chip Kelly to get the right quarterback in there. And then two, You do have two young but talented quarterbacks that are waiting for their chance. I mean, that's the thing. It's like Ethan Garber, the the fact that he couldn't quite beat out DTR gives me a little questions. And DTR played really good for them. I don't want to be like a DTR hater. So you are being a DTR hater. That probably does sound like it, but DTR at times did look very good. And at times it, it felt like it wasn't quite there, never quite developed into the guy we thought he could be. 
but that's kind of my thought on on like why not just let it rip with Dante Moore, see if he can do something this last year of the Pac-12. Because again, I mean, this offense, as much as I trust Chip Kelly to make it work, because you've never really seen him coach a bad offense at the college level, they don't really have the firepower they had last year in terms of the the pass catchers running game. Oh, another thing I disagree and- with. Let's get all right. Hey, let's chop let's it. Up. I thought you were higher on UCLA than I was. I'm let's high on the defense, and I'm high on Chip Kelly making the offense work. But I think if they're going to take that, like, be it really, really elite, I think, I think it's got to be Dante Moore. I think he's got to have a really good year. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I want to see Dante Moore. I think most UCLA fans want to see Dante Moore. You make that happen. It's your biggest recruiting win that I can remember for UCLA. Let's. Talk about these pass catchers because you lose Jake Bobo, who like was the guy. Like when UCLA wanted to push the ball down the field, it was going to Jake Bobo. You lose him. J. Michael Sturdivant is, I think, more talented than Jake Bobo. A long guy who can catch down the field and again put up numbers on Cal. That's hard to do. Like it is hard to be a productive wide receiver at Cal. You have him. You bring in Kyle Ford, another guy who I think you take a look at Sturdivant and Kyle Ford. Probably the two, they'd probably be the most talented wide receivers last year on UCLA. You throw in a guy like Cam Brown, I think the pass catchers are better this year than you saw in 2022. And that's the tough part because honestly, the unit wasn't great. Nobody caught for a thousand yards. And, and aside from Bobo, they were all under 500. So that's, again, like the unit wasn't great. I, I, I maybe I shouldn't have said they're going to be worse than they were last year, but it wasn't a great unit last year. So again, you're kind of looking. Is it going to be a great unit for the conference? Probably not. It, it will be. They're going to have to use it, do it the way Chip Kelly does it, which is just very creative, get his guys in positions to make plays and do it that way because you you don't have the the Franklins and, and, and the guys from USC who are obviously rolling three or four deep of real stars. I, I kind of think that the quarterback's going to need to play very good football. If yeah, I mean, going to take that next step. I trust, and I guess it gets back to what we're talking about. Like, I trust Chip Kelly. He's done a phenomenal job. I think, so one thing I'd push back, like, I think Chip Kelly did a phenomenal job with DTR. Like, it got off to a rough start. DTR was playing phenomenal ball by his fifth year. I think it was a great story in college football, like a highly touted guy who had some growing pains. And by that fifth year, like, DTR was one of the top quarterbacks, I thought, in the Pac-12 and maybe even in the country. You look at the running back room, this is where I'll argue, like, it's hard to get – like, Zach Charbonnet was uh, – well, he was a top three running back for us in the NFL draft. You have TJ Harden, who I know has been getting a lot of buzz, and then you go bring in the All-American beauty, Carson Steele, who owns a pet, pet crocodile, I believe, just uh, blonde hair, thick legs. Like, I think the running back room – yes, I'm not going to sit up here and say it's better off without Zach Charbonnet. I don't think it's a bad group. Well, but let's be honest about how that running attack kind of worked. There was a ton of space. Like I, I could have been running the ball. Like Zach Charbonnet is a good, good player, but you look, that running game is very creative. It's, it, I don't know how he does it. If I, if I did know, I wouldn't yeah, really you'd be making money I'd be coaching on the field. I'd be making millions, but I'm not. So I'm here talking like it. And Chip Kelly finds a way to get those running backs loose. So, I think that there is an element of this offense. It is a bit of a system offense. Like, Chip Kelly's system, he takes it, he works it with no matter who he's got. So I'm not worried at all about the running backs, frankly. I think these guys are plenty talented to get it done. And, and just Did you make an argument that this running back, I mean, like this running back group fits? Because Zach Charbonnet, what was the big knock on Charbonnet? I thought he got better as a senior. Well, the biggest knock on him was he's more of a between the tackles, like 220 plus pound guy, and not, not as efficient in space. A guy like Carson Steele, probably a little bit better in space. So maybe you can see like a little bit of improvement in terms of the personnel and how it fits. Because you even running. look at Charbonnet's production, like a lot of it was in the air. It was like, okay, let's get you out into the flats and let you work. And and you're right. Like, yes, he he's a load to bring down for sure, but you, he's not the most dynamic guy in space. Like when he gets going, he's a problem because he's big, he's physical, he runs like that. But you might have a unit that does fit it a little better just because, again, they do throw the balls to these running backs a lot and they want him to be able to play more effectively in space than, than yeah, in that in-between-the-tackles role. Now, the the question mark on offense for me is on the offensive line. You use the three top guys. A guy like Antonio Mafia was an absolute dude for UCLA last year. You bring back Duke Clemens, he's played a lot. Garrett, you, I mean, those guys played a lot last year. And then the three holes that you have, you're plugging them in with transfer portal guys, right? Mm-hmm. And the, the kid from Old Dominion sounds like, 
I mean, UCLA was really high on him. I thought that was a win. Every team wants to get a starting left tackle in the transfer portal. UCLA was able to get it done. You have Jack Wiley or Jake Wiley, excuse me, coming in from Colorado. I, I think the big question mark, you know what you have at center and right tackle. How do these transfers come in and, and kind of plug these gaps? And then depth is also a little bit of a question. And that's never like that, like I feel like we used to think was a problem. But you've seen the teams that roll in good transfer linemen. I mean, if they've proven themselves like these guys have at the college level, they typically do okay. I mean, I didn't think the UCLA offensive line was – like the greatest unit in the world last year, frankly. So and you it's don't like, need to in this Chip Kelly pass. offense. Like in no, the passing have... attack, the ball comes out quick. You get to the perimeter in the run game. Like it's a lot more – this offense is a lot more schemed up than it's like, hey, we're going to try to beat you with our five offensive linemen that you guys just can't, can't kind of work with us. So, I, the, yes, the offensive line may be some question marks, but it's hard to be seeing that it's going to be a massive liability. All right, so I was the higher one on the offensive side of the ball, it sounds like. No, I, I think maybe because, like, I think Dante Moore is going to be really good. So, I don't – I think if Dante Moore is really good, like, this offense, it definitely doesn't take a step back. Like, does it get a lot better? Maybe not, but it doesn't need to get a lot and better. it doesn't because you look at last year. I mean, I probably should have read this to start. I mean, top 10 in points per game, top 5 in yards per game, top 10 in yards per play, the number one team rushing the football last year. This was an elite offense last year. If it doesn't take steps forward and just hold serve, like, it's still going to be an elite offense. Now, there's the big question mark. Like, if UCLA wants to push for the Pac-12, if you want to call them a dark horse, they got to get better on defense, right? Outside the top 100 in points per game, 89th in the country in yards per game, in a glaring 66% completion percentage, given up to opposing quarterbacks. Dill, let's start up front because this is the group that I'm probably highest on heading into 2023. Tell us about this I mean, defense. When you talk about having – Four defensive ends who can all really rush the passer, led by Liato Liatu Lota. Might be the best edge rush in the country. He, I mean, when we talk about like that unit or, or that position group in all, all Americans, like if he's not on your list, you're just not watching football. You're like like that class of like, oh, UCLA defense, whoever comes out of UCLA defense. Like Latu is awesome, awesome player. I think the Murphy brothers can both really play. But the, you just look that top end ability the, from lots the of Murphy changes. brothers are going to take a step up too. Like you saw them kind of put it together, but they were going from North Texas to UCLA. And like, that's a big step up in competition. I love having them get a full off season with UCLA coming in and being okay. This is my second year at the power five level. The Murphy brothers shout out to twin power, absolute dogs. And here's a group that I'm a little higher than on you. I think also when we were talking before this, the inside of this defensive line I think it's pretty good. Like, I like what Gary Smith does. He has a job. I think he does it at a high level. Jay Torrey, who is a guy that we wanted to come to Michigan when he was coming out of high school. And then you go and get Keanu Williams. Like, this front seven, because we'll talk about the linebackers too, I I think is pretty damn good. I am I mean, I'm with you. I'm talking. When you think this defensive line, like, do I – I think the defensive tackles just need to play better. I think they're, they're, they had their moments for sure, but they yeah. probably did give up too many rushing – like big rushing plays where they're too big a hole. So it's that's unit that, again, they were kind of young last year in a sense. I mean, Toy was only yep. a, a sophomore. sophomore yeah. Gary Smith was obviously a true junior. So you do now have a very experienced group, and you add a guy like Keanu Williams. So that unit, again, that just needs to get a little bit better. But you lead with that, that defensive end group. That's going to be a monster unit. And then you look at the linebackers. Another guy who I think is criminally slept on is Darius Mwasu. M- I mean, a guy who flies around the field, goes sideline to sideline, does it all, just makes a ton, a ton of tackles, which you're kind of not seeing as much. Like those middle linebackers who make that, yeah, are just a zillion million tackles. That's kind of scary. <laughs> a zillion million. I would also throw in Olu, o, uh, Olu Oladejo coming over from Cal. He's another guy that, I mean, 6'3, 255 pounds. He looks like a freak balled out against UCLA as well. Like the front seven is good. Now, Here's the question mark, and here's my take on UCLA, and this is why I'm high on UCLA. Like, I have question marks about the second day. It was, I don't think it was a very good group. You lose a guy like Mo Osling, who I think was really good for UCLA last year. You noted you like the personnel. What I'm more this high on is got to be the Danton Lynn effect. He's coming in. He's it's his job to make this secondary work. And again, you talk like I think they have the talent, especially at that cornerback spot. They're returning three or four guys. You, you talk Humphrey, David Davies. Kirkwood all played a lot of football. Alex Johnson played a little bit too in the nickel. Like you have a lot of guys who are, they're big athletic. I don't get why they're giving up. Like they're not, 
I just feel like they play a very passive brand of defense in the secondary last year, and it made these guys look worse than they are. Like, why don't you go t- challenge wideouts? You have the players to do it. Just hang going to do it. And one other thing that I think doesn't get talked enough about is if, and we have this conversation a few times, would you rather have an elite secondary and elite pass rush? Like, what's yeah, the best way to protect the secondary? You might have question marks. You fast or rewind, I should say, two years ago, Kirby Smart going into the 2021 season for the Georgia Bulldogs was like, our secondary is a problem. Like, well, I just don't think we have the guys. Did it matter? No, because they had a pass rush where, I mean, the quarterback just did not have a pocket to throw from, did not have time to step up. And so the best way to defend a secondary where you might have some question marks is an elite pass rush. And I think UCLA has that this year to kind of maybe defend or kind of hide a secondary that I'm a little lower on than you. And so you look at this UCLA team heading into 2023, there are three games that I think you have start. You go on the road to Utah, on the road to Oregon State, and on the road to USC. We talked about how I think it fits really well in terms of when you're playing those teams. If UCLA can get two out of three of those, or even one out of three of those, I think you're looking at a 10-2 and season for UCLA and certainly pushing for a a Pac-12 championship appearance. And if you win the Pac-12 this year, you have a very good argument for the college football playoff, even with a loss or two. I I think this is a very, very difficult Pac-12 to run through. But you're right. UCLA is kind of their schedule shakes out to give them a very good chance to win it. And I feel like it's a team that's just getting slept on because on paper you lose a lot of production, right? You lose your starting quarterback, your starting running back, both to the NFL draft. This is a team that, uh, again, I think people need to be talking about. And I'll probably start referencing UCLA as a top team in the Pac-12 because when I dug into this team, like there is a lot to like about what you're seeing. Again. Wanted to keep it short. Didn't really keep it short, but appreciate you guys if you're listening now for rocking with us. If you do enjoy the content, consider subscribing to the channel, and we'll talk to y'all later. Peace.